that are here before the commission. A final rule establishing a safety standard for infant support cushions and a notice of proposed rulemaking on infant neck floats. We'll start with the infant uh, support cushions and then move to the neck, neck floats. Before we start, I just want to confirm that um, Commissioner Ziak is down in the room, can see and hear us. Can you see and hear us? I, I can, yes, thank you. And we can see and hear you. Uh, the final rule that is before us today would, for the first time, establish mandatory safety standards for infant support cushions. From 2010 to 2022, we know of at least 79 deaths and an additional 124 incidents with these products. Staff's work on this product category is part of our larger effort to improve the safety of durable products sold for the use of infants, as mandated by Section 104 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. In a moment, I'm going to turn this meeting over to staff so they can brief us. Once they have completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions with multiple rounds if necessary. As a reminder, if you have questions that address statutory interpretation or legal advice, please do not ask them at this time. We'll, we can hold a closed executive session at the end of the two briefings upon request. Briefing us today are Ashley Johnson, a physiologist in the Office of Hazard and Identification and Reduction, and David uh, DiMatteo, attorney in the Office of General Counsel. Now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Johnson and Mr. DiMatteo. Start that one again. <laughs> Thank you and good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Ashley Johnson, the Project Manager for Infant Support Cushions Rulemaking Effort. Today, David and I will discuss staff's draft final rule for infant support cushions. Next slide, please. Today's presentation will begin with an overview from David regarding the underlying statutory framework for this rulemaking. Then I will provide an overview of the product and other background information, review the incident data and hazard patterns associated with the product, discuss the status of the draft ASTM standard for infant loungers, and discuss the public comments staff received on the NPR and the notice of availability. I will then describe the draft final rule and the potential small business impact of the rule, followed by staff's final recommendation. Now I will turn the presentation over to David. Next slide, please. Good morning. The commission is required to issue a consumer product safety standards for durable infant or toddler products under section 104B of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008, commonly known as the CPSIA, in accordance with the notice and comment procedure in the Administrative Procedure Act. The NPR initiated a notice and comment process to develop the final rule. Next slide, please. Section 104B of the CPSI directs the commission to consult with representatives of consumer groups, juvenile product manufacturers, and independent child product engineers and experts to examine and assess the effectiveness of any voluntary consumer product safety standards for durable infant and toddler products. If a voluntary standard exists, CPSC must issue standards that are substantially the same as the relevant voluntary standard or more stringent than the volunteer standard if the commission determines that more stringent requirements would further reduce the risk of injury. If there is no voluntary standard, the commission must promulgate its own standard and continue promulgating standards for durable infant and toddler products until CPSC has promulgated standards for all such product categories. And this reading of the statute has been upheld by the DC Circuit Court of Appeals in the Finbin versus CPSC case where they affirmed that the commission not only has the authority to regulate durable infant or toddler products for which no voluntary standard exists, it is required to do so by section 104B2's express statutory command to regulate all categories of infant or toddler products. Now I will turn the briefing back over to Ashley to provide you a overview of the draft final rule. Next slide, please. Thank you, David. If it's support cushions are infant products that are filled with or comprised of resilient material, such as foam, fibrous batting, or granular material, or with a gel, liquid, or gas, and which is marketed design or intended to support an infant's weight or any portion of an infant while reclining or in a supine prone or recumbent position. Examples of these products are shown on the images on this slide. Infant support cushions include products such as infant loungers that may have walls around their perimeters, infant head position or pillows, infant sleep positioners and anti-rollover pillows, crib pillows, wedge pillows for infants, stuffed toys or pads marketed for use as an infant support cushion, multi-purpose pillows marketed for both nursing and lounging, and tummy time pillows. All of the products shown here would fall under the scope of the draft final rule. Next slide, please. 
In 1992, pursuant to the Commission's authority under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, or FHSA, the Commission banned any article known as an infant cushion or infant pillow and any other similar article that has all five following features. Has a flexible fabric covering, is loosely filled with a granular material, is easily flattened, is capable of conforming to the body or face of an infant, and is intended or promoted for use by children under one year of age. The ban was intended to address a specific type of product, an infant beanbag cushion, that was popular in the 80s and was used as a mattress during a time when the recommended sleep position for infants was face down prone. However, most infant support cushions on the market today are loosely filled or simply filled with some type of cushy foam or soft fibers batting rather than a granular material and are therefore not within the scope of the infant pillow ban. Staff has become concerned about the potential suffocation and fall hazards these products present to infants. The ban continues to apply, and this rule is intended to address additional products that do not meet this ban. Next slide, please. Staff search of the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System and National Electronic Injury Surveillance System databases identified 79 fatal incidents that were associated with infant support cushions and involved infants up to 12 months of age. Nearly all reported fatalities involved infants six months old or younger, and most involved infants three months old or younger, a particularly vulnerable age bracket. The cause of death was generally asphyxia-related where known. Nearly all reported fatalities involved placement of infant support cushion on another sleep-related consumer product. In about 40% of the fatal incidents, the infant support cushion was placed in an infant product such as a bassinet, crib, or play yard. In nearly half of the fatal incidents, the infant support cushion was placed in an adult sleep setting, such as a adult bed, couch or futon, or an air mattress. The major hazard patterns identified by staff from analysis of the fatal incidents were the following. The use of an infant support cushion as an in-bed sleeper to facilitate bed sharing. Placement of the infant and or movement of the infant within the infant support cushion, resulting in occlusion of the nose and mouth while remaining in the product. And the infant rolling off the support cushion into a hazardous setting. Next slide, please. Although reported fatalities are staff's primary concern, staff also searched for non-fatal incidents related to infant support cushions to identify other possible risks of injury. Staff identified 124 non-fatal incidents and consumer concerns associated with infant support cushions. Many of the non-fatal incidents were consumer concerns. About a quarter of the non-fatal incidents were due to falls from an infant support cushion that was placed on an elevated surface, such as an adult bed, bath or kitchen counters, chairs, and couches. About another quarter of the incidents were the result of the infant being found in a vulnerable position and rescued from a potentially asphyxiating environment. 14% of the non-fatal incidents reported a rash while using the product, and there was one report each for limb entrapment, mold, choking, near strangulation, and vomiting. Based on this incident analysis, staff identified falls and threatened asphyxia as the two major non-fatal hazard patterns associated with infant support cushions. Next slide, please. Currently, there are no published voluntary standards for infant support cushions. In December 2021, staff requested ASTM to form a working group under F15 to develop a voluntary standard containing requirements to reduce the risk of death and injury from hazards associated with infant support cushions. ASTM subsequently formed F1521 Infant Loungers Subcommittee. On March 25th, 2024, ASTM issued a ballot for a draft voluntary standard for infant loungers. This ballot closed on April 29th, 2024 and received eight negative votes and other comments, including a comment from staff. On September 16th, ASTM issued a second ballot, which addressed the negative comments and other comments on the draft standard for infant loungers. This ballot closes on October 16th. Like the draft final rule, the ASTM standard includes requirements related to infant restraints, side angle, and product firmness. And like the draft final rule, the ASTM standard also includes marking and labeling requirements that include a permanent and conspicuous warning that must appear on all products covered by the standard, as well as requirements for instructional literature to accompany the products. The primary difference between the two are related to scope. The draft ASTM voluntary standard includes less products than are within the scope of the infant support cushion draft final rule. To be clear, the ASTM standard for infant loungers, which includes only infant loungers and not other types of infant support cushion, is still in draft form and has not yet completed the full consensus process to be an approved standard. Therefore, the draft language is subject to change. Next slide, please. On January 16, 2024, the Commission issued a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPR, 
under Section 104 of the CPSIA that proposed a mandatory consumer product safety standard for infant support cushions to address the risks of death and injury associated with these products. The proposed standard included performance, testing, labeling, and instructional literature requirements to address the suffocation, entrapment, and fall risks associated with infant support cushions. It addresses suffocation hazards by requiring that all surfaces be sufficiently firm that they are unlikely to conform to an infant's face and include the airway, and by setting a maximum incline that would prevent hazardous positioning of the infant's head and neck along the surfaces of the product. The proposed standard also sets a side angle requirement that addresses the risk of suffocation between the sidewall and the occupant support surface. Further, it addresses fall hazards because the maximum incline angle of 10 degrees or less presents excessive sidewall height that could encourage caregivers to mistakenly believe that these products are safe for unattended infants on elevated surfaces. It also requires a strongly worded, conspicuous, and permanent on product warning label. Next slide, please. On April 23rd, 2024, CPSC published a notice of availability or NOA with a 30 day comment period. The NOA announced the availability of and saw comments from the public on the incident data relied upon for the NPR, which included 83 in depth investigation reports, among other incident reports. Next slide, please. The commission received 18 public comments on the NPR and one public comment on the NOA. These topics addressed in these comments fell into several broad categories, including the scope of the rule, definitions, general requirements, the performance requirements of the rule and their associated test methods, the marking and labeling requirements of the rule, the effective date, small business issues, stockpiling concerns, and procedural and constitutional issues. Next slide, please. I'll now briefly summarize staff's draft final rule. The draft final rule contains several modifications and clarifications in response to the public comments. Like the NPR, the draft final rule defines infant support cushions as shown here. An infant product that is filled with or comprised of resilient material, such as foam, fibrous batting, or granular material, or with a gel, liquid, or gas, and which is marketed, designed, or intended to support an infant's weight or any portion of an infant while reclining or in a supine, prone, or recumbent position. In response to public comment, this definition now includes any removable covers or slip covers that are sold on or together with an infant support cushion. The draft final rule retains the scope as proposed in the NPR. As mentioned before, the draft final rule includes, but is not limited to, infant positioners, nursing products with a dual use for lounging, infant loungers, infant props or cushions used to support an infant for activities such as tummy time, and other infant pillow-like products. An infant support cushion does not include products regulated by other CPSC durable infant and toddler product standards, with the exception of nursing pillows that are also marketed for lounging. Staff's draft final rule does not apply to removable padding or padded seat liners sold with or as a replacement part for a product primarily used to transport, entertain, or feed infants that are specifically designed to fit that product because those products fall into that specific safety standard. The Draft final rule includes definitions for the following terms using the draft final rule. Conspicuous, infant lounger, infant positioner, infant support cushion, occupant support surface, seat bite line, and sidewall. A new definition was added for the term sidewall in response to a public comment to provide clarity regarding the meaning of that term. Next slide, please. Like the NPR, the draft final rule includes general requirements to address the potential hazards associated with sharp edges or points, small parts, lead in paints, attachment of toy accessories, and the removal of components like zipper poles and buttons that are accessible to an infant. The draft final rule also includes the same warning permacy requirements in the NPR, including the requirement to prevent free hanging labels that attach to the product at only one end. The draft final rule states that if an infant support cushion can be converted into another product for which a con consumer product safety specification exists, the product shall comply with the applicable requirements of that standard as well. The draft final rule removes the proposed section regarding side height as unnecessary and duplicative because the maximum incline angle test already accounts for the height of the product remaining under two inches. Next slide, please. 
The draft final rule includes the NPR requirement that prohibits all infant support cushions from including an infant restraint system. It also includes strength requirements in the NPR for seams to address seam failures and similar product integrity issues and a bounded opening test to mitigate a strangulation hazard. Next slide, please. Like in the proposed rule, the draft final rule includes a firmness requirement for the occupant support surface, the sidewall, and the intersection between the occupant support surface and the sidewall. These requirements use a three inch hemispheric probe that are consistent with the size and shape of the infant's face. In addition, the firmness requirement is easily applied to different types and sizes of surface areas that could present in the variety of products that fall under the scope of this standard. For the occupant support surface firmness test, the probe is applied to an area of maximal thickness and at another location most likely to fail. At these locations, the probe is used to displace in a vertical direction the product surface by one inch. The force that is needed to displace the one inch must be greater than 10 newtons. This displacement force is comparable to the displacement force required for crib mattresses. For the sidewall firmness and intersection of the sidewall and occupant support surface, the same test method is used, but it is applied to these different locations as illustrated in the diagram on the slide. Essentially, it is the intention that these require in these requirements that any surface that an infant could potentially come in contact with while using the infant support cushion should be about as firm as a crib mattress. The draft final rule retains the firmness requirements from the NPR and also clarifies that the sidewall firmness test and the intersection of the sidewall and occupant support service test apply to products that contain a sidewall because the proposed rule did not clarify performance requirements for products without a sidewall. It also clarifies that products sold with a slipcover worn or together with the product are to be tested as assembled with the slipcover installed on the product. Additionally, all products, including products one inch or less in thickness, shall be tested. Next slide, please. To address potential suffocation hazards at the intersection of the sidewall and occupant support service that isn't fully addressed by the firmness requirement alone, the draft final rule includes a sidewall angle requirement. This requirement uses the hemispheric probe applied to the intersection between the occupant support service and the sidewall to determine the angle of this interface, which should be greater than 90 degrees. Like in the NPR, the draft final rule retains this requirement with the clarification that this requirement applies to products that contain a sidewall because the proposed rule, again, did not clarify performance requirements for products without a sidewall. It also clarifies that products sold with a slipcover worn or together with the product are to be tested as assembled with the slipcover on the product. Additionally, all products, including products one inch or less in thickness, shall be tested. Next slide, please. Like the NPR, the draft final rule includes a maximum incline angle requirement to reduce the potential for hazardous neck positioning and fall hazards. To meet this requirement, the maximum incline angle of the product cannot exceed 10 degrees when measured using the newboard hinge gauge. Using the gauge, the incline angle shall be measured from the highest surface that can support the infant, including sides, to the lowest surface that can support the infant, including the floor or the surface the product is placed on. Due to the geometry of the gauge and the methodology for measuring the angle, this requirement would limit the height of the side that an infant occupant comes in contact with while using the product to about but less than two inches. Staff has observed that products that pass the maximum incline angle requirement provide a visual cue to caregivers that the product will not contain the infant occupant. This requirement additionally mitigates the fall hazard because caregivers, seeing that the product does not appear to contain the infant, will be less likely to leave an infant unsupervised on the product or to place the product on an elevated surface when the infant does not appear secure in the product. Next slide, please. Like the NPR, the draft final rule includes requirements for a prominent, strongly worded on product warning that addresses the primary hazards associated with infant support cushions, with particular emphasis on the potentially deadly consequences of using these products for naps or sleep and warning caregivers about the dangers of using soft bedding in and around the product. The warning is required to be conspicuous and permanent. The warning statements in the draft final rule shown on this slide has undergone several revisions in response to the public comments. These include the draft final rule adds a new figure, which is illustrated on the right of the slide for products with a tummy time feature. The statement put baby one back after tummy time is added to the warning label after the phrase use on the floor with baby on back face up to accommodate multi-use positions of some infant support cushions, such as tummy time pillows, 
that may have features that require the infant to be on their stomach while using the product. This statement bullet point was also moved up within the warning statement to reflect the serious hazard to infants presented by prone positioning. This new figure is required only for products that have a tummy time feature because only products that have a tummy time feature should allow for prone positioning. The draft final rule requires the other warning label on the left depicted on the slide for all other infant support cushions. The draft final rule retains the requirement in both warning labels to contain the statement using this product for sleep or naps can kill to reinforce all types of sleep. However, the warning labels have been revised with more concise wording and clarity to provide instruction for what a caregiver should do if their baby falls asleep by separating stay near and watch baby during use from if a baby falls asleep, move baby to an infant sleep product such as a crib or bassinet. The phrase use only with an awake baby has been removed from the warning labels in the draft final rule because the safety messaging to not use infant support cushions with sleeping infants or in a sleep setting is already strongly communicated throughout the initial sentence of the warning about the deadly consequences of using this product for sleep or naps. Both warning labels now include the statement, do not use on soft surfaces or in sleep products like crib or bassinets. Keep blankets and other soft items out and away from the product to discourage soft bedding use both in and around the product. This revision also separates the warning statement into a separate bullet point to emphasize the serious risk to infants from blankets and other soft items in and around the product. This draft final rule also retains the NPR's requirements for instructional literature that must accompany infant support cushions. Next slide, please. As required by section 604 of the Regulatory Flexibility Act, staff prepared a final regulatory flexibility analysis describing the possible economic impact of the draft final rule on small entities, including small businesses. Staff has identified more than 2,000 suppliers of infant support cushions to U.S. market, and most U.S. firms are small businesses. The draft final rule is expected to have a significant impact on a substantial number of small entities, particularly home crafters, because currently there are no mandatory or voluntary performance standards for infant support cushions. Most in-scope products on the market will require redesign to meet the requirements in this draft final rule and these one-time redesign costs, including the cost to design warning labels and instructional manuals, will be potentially significant for a substantial number of small firms for the first year that this rule is effective. Regarding the effective date, staff recommends an effective date of 180 days after publication of the final rule to allow time for suppliers to bring their products into compliance and to test to the new standard. No new complex testing or instruments or devices would be required to test infant support cushions for compliance with the final rule. This amount of time is typical for rules issued under Section 104 of the CPSIA. Six months is also the period that the Juvenile Product Manufacturer Association typically allows for products in their certification program to shift to a new standard once that standard is published. Next slide, please. Based on the information presented here and in staff's draft final rule for infant support cushions federal register notice, staff recommends that the commission publish the final rule for infant support cushions with an effective date of 180 days following publication of the final rule in the federal register. I now welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation briefing. I'm now gonna to turn to questions to the commissioners. I'm gonna start with myself. And again, thanks to not only the two of you, but the entire staff that have been working on this rule for quite some time. Parents have a right to expect uh, that the products that they buy for their infants are safe. Congress recognizes that and directed us to establish um, standards. And I'm glad that we are moving forward to establish standards with respect to this category of products that has been covered to date. Um, with respect to questions, uh, Dr. Johnson, the range of products covered by the proposed rule is broad. I know that the SDN uh, subcommittee working in this area has chose to focus on loungers alone. Can you discuss the benefits of the broader approach? Yeah, that's correct. So the draft ASTM standard it, it includes a subset, um, only infant loungers, while this draft final rule includes all types of infant support cushions. Um, when staff analyzed the incident data, uh, for hazard pattern analysis, what we saw is that consumers were using these products, infant support cushions, 
in similar ways and their behaviors were the same for all of these products. So their hazard patterns were the same. They were using them on elevated surfaces. They were using them for sleep. So uh, because they are using these products in the same ways and the hazard patterns are the same, um, staff concludes that uh, this rule comprehensively uh, addresses the hazards, the suffocation and fall hazards associated with these products. Thank you. And can you talk a bit more about the maximum incline angle and how that led to the establishment of a maximum side height requirement? Um, and also explain why the staff rejected the request for higher sides. Yeah, so, uh, staff um, ultimately did not recommend a maximum side height for the product. Some of these products don't have sidewalls. Um, think something like a flat plane mat that doesn't contain sidewalls. But staff was very concerned about. Um, hazardous neck positioning of an infant um, along the, the top side of the product or the highest side if it is a sidewall of the product. One thing we saw in our data is that infants were rolling out of these products, sometimes completely, but sometimes only partially. So staff was concerned about hazardous neck positioning of the infant along the sidewall of the product. So the maximum incline angle of 10 degrees or less is intended to address that positioning um, and that positional asphyxiation risk. Another thing that we saw in the incident data is that infants were falling from these products and they were being placed on elevated surfaces and they were falling. These products have high cushioned sides. Um, when, it, when a caregiver places their infant in the product, they appear secure in the product because of these cushioned sides that are four, sometimes five inches. And they're placed them on elevated surface that infants are falling off of these. So they think that their infants are contained in the product when they're when they're not. They have the false perception that, that that's that's what these products you know are, are are intended to do is to contain their infant. In contrast, the maximum incline angle mathematically limits the side height of the product to about but less than two inches. And uh, what this does is it provides a visual cue to the caregiver that their infant is not contained in this product. Their infant is higher than the product now and is not contained. And it encouraged caregivers to place the product on the floor and to not place them in a hazardous sleep setting where they could roll partially or fully off the product. Thank you. I do recognize that parents do want a safe place to uh, put their baby down um, even outside of a crib or such. Can you describe the type of products that would meet the standards that are being proposed? Yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, we recognize that uh, caregivers utilize these products. They like these products and they buy them. Um, and, uh, you know, what we want is a, a product that mitigates the suffocation and fall risk. So what these products would look like is they would be firmer. Um, they would be firmer than the products currently on the market in order to meet the various firmness requirements. They would be flatter in order to meet the maximum incline angle. So they would be no higher than than two inches. Um, and they also would have um, a side angle um, between the sidewall and occupant support surface or between the highest part of the product uh, not, that um, was greater than 90 degrees so that um, part of the product can't overhang into the occupant support area, which could create a hazardous pocket, a soft pocket that an infant's uh, face could be pressed into and it could occlude the airways. Um, but those, the, all those can be met and will be, uh, would be met. In, Correct. Correct. Yeah. All of the products can be redesigned to meet these requirements. Then, like I said, they will be firmer and they will be flatter. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, those are my questions for now. I'm going to turn over to my colleagues, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Johnson, Mr. DiMatteo, uh, again, thank you for your, your, not only your work, but the, the work of your teams on this uh, for the presentation today and, and for the recommendation. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having a standard in place that's going to improve safety with respect to these products. Um, a couple questions. Uh, the, the final rule would cover removable covers and slip covers that are sold with the Product, but not aftermarket uh, uh, slip covers, um, and this is similar to concerns that were raised um, in the commission's consideration of uh, uh, our, our nursing pillow standard. Um, and I'm assuming that the concern here that that would be raised would have to do with um, the, the 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 prominent display of, of of the warning that you might have an aftermarket slip cover that could obscure that or or, or make that uh, uh, not totally visible and therefore not effective. Um, did staff analyze uh, the whether or not aftermarket covers are widely available? Uh, there are aftermarket covers um, that are sold for these products. Um, how we have how we have it written in the draft final rule is to cover uh, slip covers that are sold on or with the product. Um, that's something that staff 
um, is definitely going to look at um, and to see whether we see this in the incident data. And, and like you said, we are concerned that if um, the slip covers, um, if they are not tested, uh, not only are we concerned that they would cover the warning label, but we're also concerned that they may be cushioned um, and they may introduce a suffocation hazard um, if they're not otherwise installed and tested on the product. Um, but as far as third third party, um, that's something that staff is going to continue to look at. Okay, is this something that the ASTM standard? I know that it's not finalized yet, but but as drafted, uh, is, is is would 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 that proposed standard touch aftermarket covers at all? It's something that the ASTM uh, group has has discussed, um, but it is not currently included in the ballot um, that is open now. Okay, and if we're not covering it here, after aftermarket covers um, you know, under 104 uh, that that were uh, you know limited to considering durable products, would we be able to reach these products through uh, a subsequent seven to nine rulemaking, or should ASTM finalize a, a standard that covers aftermarkets? That's something later down the road that the commission could consider adoption. I think it's something that do you want to get to that? Yeah, I think we do have authority. The commission has authority under seven and nine as one of the authorities that you could do a rulemaking like that. It wouldn't necessarily be under one oh four, but you could do it under seven and nine. Okay, that's that's good to know that that we have options. Um changing topic slightly, uh, but still on the, the topic of warning labels. Uh, you mentioned a, a separate warning label for um, products that have a tummy time feature. Uh, perhaps this is my own ignorance showing, but how do you determine whether or not a product is um, it has a, a tummy time feature? Is that based on how it's marketed or are there um, a, a objective design features that the commission would look to uh, to make a determination as to whether or not it's a tummy time product? A tummy time product would be a product that is marketed or intended to allow prone positioning for tummy time for the infant. Um, so that would be something that, I, you know, it would, I think, be looked at a product by product basis um, on whether something is a lounge or whether something is a tummy time pillow. But um, other products should not allow prone placement um, if it's not um, a multi-use product for tummy time. Okay. Um that's that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, lastly, uh, you gave a, a fairly comprehensive list of the non fatal injuries that the commission looked at uh, and that 14% of those had to do with dermatological or, 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 or rashes. Um, I, I'm not sure based on the sample size, whether or not that's significant, but d does our proposed uh, does the, the, the commission's proposed uh, rule at this stage uh, touch on anything related to lessening that injury? No, um, that's something that um, staff will continue to look at, you know, as we update our, our data yearly. Um, the the proposed requirements uh, don't address uh, rash concerns right now, um, but if we can establish a hazard pattern for that, that'll definitely be something. I think staff. that's something that's that's worthwhile to continue looking into, particularly as we're seeing uh, uh, products that are foreign produced using uh, coverings with certain coatings and, and substandard materials. Uh, I, I think this is increasingly something that the commission needs to pay attention to, uh, but particularly in the, uh, the, 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 the infant and toddler context. Uh, again, thank you all very much for your work. I appreciate the presentation today, and uh, I'm glad that we are where we are at this point. Thank you. Commissioner Trump. Thank you. Um, this draft final rule is well thought out, well reasoned, and much appreciated. Thank you for putting it before us. Um, your work can save many young lives. And you also, I, I want to pay particular uh, appreciation to the fact that you thought about in various parts of this rule how bad actors might try to get around it, and you tried to protect against that preemptively, and that is a great approach. So thank you for that. I just have a few questions, and they're mainly um, minor clarifications that I want to make sure I understand. So the, the first goes to a statement in the package that infant support cushions uh, don't meet the definition of infant sleep products, because they're not marketed or intended to provide sleeping accommodations. And what I want to make sure of is that we're not saying these products can evade regulation by making sleep claims, but that they fall into one of two buckets, either sleepers that are subject to the Infant Sleep Products Rule and Safe Sleep for Babies Act, or this rule. Is, is my understanding correct on that? That is, that is correct, absolutely. Oh, okay. Um, and then... Uh, a question on uh, page OS 26 of the package, we talk about framed seating products, and we say that they're not subject to the rule. Um, but when we say that framed seating products isn't exactly a defined term, we give, them, we give some examples and we say 
Uh, the package refers to, quote, frame seating products, including infant floor seats, rockers, strollers, car seats, infant carriers, swings, high chairs, bouncers. So we're talking about other regulated product categories, it sounds like. And what I wonder is if we could put outer bounds on that. I don't want to call it an exemption, but, but on those products that aren't subject to the rule, could we put outer bounds on that by perhaps saying um, frame seating products already subject to another CPSC rule? Frame seating products aren't infant support cushions, so we didn't have to put, you know, we didn't put an exemption in for them because they're not subject to the rule. Um, as far as adding any language about it, um, I guess that's something that we could. I would just note that, like, basically, they don't meet the definition of an infant support cushion, so thus they're not subject to the rule. And if it doesn't meet, like, a frame carrier product type product, they have a firm frame. They're not going to meet the definition, so they're not subject. Typically, when you give an exemption in a rule, it means something is subject to the rule, but for an otherwise some other given reason, you're not going to make them meet the requirements of an example of that is in the rule. We have a, a provision for if you're on the if you have durable infant 104 rule type rules that are under the uh, 1130 regulation that lists all the ones that have to register and do the, the registration, they're not required to meet the requirements. And the, the reasoning behind that is because those rules all are already subject to another standard. Okay. Um, in response to, to one comment, the package, this one seems maybe very minor. I was just hoping you could help me with the definition. Um, we add a definition to sidewall and, and we define it as quote, any vertical wall at the edge of an occupant support surface but I think, you know, as we talk about through the package and as you talked about earlier today, we don't want a, a wall that's inward. We want them to be more than vertical. We want them to be outside of 90 degrees. And when I think vertical, the definition that I'm more familiar with is, is perpendicular to the horizontal axis, so straight up and down 90 degrees. And that's not what we mean, I don't think. But, but do we think we capture the intent of what we mean with the word vertical, or is there maybe another word we need to use for that? Um, that's something the team can look at, but I think our intention for um, adding the sidewall was to describe to testing labs what a sidewall looks like so that they know if their product needs to test to, to those requirements that apply to sidewalls. Um, we still have described in the side angle test that the side angle needs to be greater than 90 degrees, but that's 90 degrees as respect to from the sidewall to the occupant support surface. Yeah, I mean, I think the intent's clear. I just let me know if the word vertical is the one we need to use or not, uh, uh, follow up would be appreciated there. Um, and then the, the last question, the package states that these products have utility and you, you mentioned it again today for parents to place their infant in when actively supervised. Uh, and I just wanted to check this role of, of being a place where you can put a baby under active supervision, other products fill that same role, right? Bouncers, rockers, uh, things like a, a blanket on the floor, those fill that same role, right? Correct. Yeah, we see these as another another tool for for parents to have a place to to place their infant while they're actively supervising them. Just one. So no unique utility in that respect. One of many things that could do that. Yeah, one of you know, and not and obviously these products are not intended for sleep. They're intended for awake, supervised use, like other durable nursery products. Yeah. Um. I'll I'll, I'll finish where I started. This is really great work. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we are where we are, and I thank you for everything you've done to get us here. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will echo my colleagues in expressing my thanks to you, Dr. Johnson, Mr. Mateo, and everyone on the team for this work, which has been going on for uh, more years than I'd like to count. So I really appreciate that we've finally gotten to this point. So thank you very much. I think I just have one question um, uh, to ask, and that is about, um, I think on page OS9, it's the definition of the product, and you go through some of the changes that um, you made in, in response to comments. Uh, and you said that you changed the definition of infant lounger. Uh, you changed the term from infant product to infant support cushion. And, and on page OS55, it indicates uh, that that change was in response to comments from Graco. Uh, and I guess if you could just explain why that's a clarification and why you made that change, it wasn't evident to me. Yeah, um, it it um, it just added more clarity to uh, that we were talking about infant support cushions and that infant loungers are a, a type of infant support cushion. Just to add more clarity that we weren't just talking about some type of infant product that a lounger is an infant support cushion. It's just a type of an infant support cushion. But in 
but you didn't make that same change for um, positioners. It just, I just worry that is there some way that that's narrowing inadvertently and just want to in, inquire whether that was what the source of the comments were. In this specific instance, it, it was in response to the public comment um, to provide clarity. Okay, alrighty. Thank you so much again. I would uh, say that I really appreciate all of the work uh, and I'm glad that we are finally here today. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, Mr. DeMatteo, uh, the entire team that worked on this at CPSC, as well as the many outside stakeholders who commented on this and, and worked to bring us where we are today. Thank you for all your work. Uh, I don't have any uh, questions and I apologize for not being there in person today. I have to attend a uh, family funeral uh, early this afternoon. Uh, I, I did want to follow up on a comment Commissioner Feldman made about the chemical issues that may be present in some of these products. I, I think, uh, I don't want to speak for him, but I suspect that uh, comment, that concern may arise out of a recent trip he and I took to visit our port inspectors uh, where we were participating in, in, in some of the things they do. And it came to our attention how many of uh, singular products or small batch products uh, can be uh, uh, can contain chemicals and things that I would not have uh, appreciated being uh, in fabrics that are there. So I, I do think that is worthy of follow up. But uh, other than that, uh, thank you for your work and I look forward to our final vote on this rulemaking. I join my colleagues and thank you for your support uh, work on this as well as the rest of the team who's not present. Um, at this point in time, we're going to move to the second briefing of uh, the day. So um, I thank you and ask that the staff for the next briefing move to the table. And as soon as they have swapped, we can begin the next floats NPR briefing. All right, now we're going to bring uh, begin our second briefing of the morning staffs going to brief us on draft notice proposed rulemaking establishing a safety standard for neck floats within the existing toy standard. These neck floats can be used by caregivers to give babies freedom of movement in pools and bathtubs, but staff has found that these floats can pose a risk of drowning when a baby slips through the float or otherwise is submerged in water. Proposed performance standards designed to reduce this drowning risk staff briefing us today are Zachary Goldstein, mechanical engineer in the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, and Tabby Zeb, an attorney in the Office of General Counsel. Mr. Goldstein, Ms. Zeb, please begin. Uh, use your... Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. My name is Zachary Goldstein. I am a mechanical engineer within the Directorate for Laboratory Sciences and the Project Manager for the NECFLOAT Rulemaking Project. I'm here today with Tabby Zeb, an attorney from the Office of General Counsel, to discuss staff's draft proposed rule for neck floats intended to address the risk of death and injury to children due to drowning while using these products. Next slide, please. Tabby will start us off by providing background information and then discuss the statutory framework for this proposed rule. Next, I will present a summary of the hazard patterns found in incident data, along with staff's draft proposed rule, the potential small business impact, and staff's recommendations. I will now turn things over to Tabby to explain the applicable legal authority for this draft NPR. Next slide. Thank you, Zachary. Good morning, everyone. I'll briefly overview the background and legal framework for this rule. Pursuant to Section 106 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008, or the CPSIA, the Commission made the existing voluntary standard ASTM F96307 with modifications the mandatory standard for toys. In February 2017, the Commission published the existing rule for toys incorporating by reference ASTM F963 as a mandatory standard in 16 CFR Part 1250. 
The STM standard was updated five times since 2008, and the existing rule incorporates the 2023 version of the voluntary standard in Part 1250, which was updated in January 2024. Next slide. The Commission can issue the draft proposed rule pursuant to its authority under Section 106 of the CPSIA. Section 106 of the CPSIA requires the Commission to issue safety standards for toys using the notice and common procedure in the Administrative Procedure Act or the APA. Under the requirements of the APA, the draft NPR initiates a notice and comment process for developing a final rule. Section 106D requires the Commission to examine and assess the ASCM standard in consultation with consumer groups, product manufacturers, and independent child product engineers and experts, and promulgate consumer product safety standards for toys that are more stringent than the voluntary standard if it would further reduce the risk of injury associated with such toys. Section 106C further requires the Commission to periodically review and revise rules set forth under Section 106 to ensure such rules provide the highest safety, I'm sorry, the highest level of safety for such products that is feasible. Now, Zachary will explain staff's recommended draft proposed rule. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Neck floats are flotation toys that support the weight of the user by their neck and water. The neck float itself is typically a ring shaped object that can be opened at a point to allow it to wrap around the child's neck where it is then secured by a restraint system. Pictured on this slide are a variety of neck float samples, including inflatable neck floats, which attain shape and form by adding air and inherently buoyant neck floats that attain shape and form using a foam insert, which is then wrapped with the fabric cover. Next slide. As part of this NPR, staff proposes to define neck floats as an article, whether inflatable or not, that encircles the neck, supports the weight of the user by being secured around the neck, such as by fastening, tightening, or other methods, is used as an instrument of play in water environments, including sinks, baths, paddling pools, and swimming pools, and is intended for use by children up to and including four years of age. Next slide, please. Now I'll present the hazard patterns found in the incident data. Staff identified 115 incidents through the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System, or CPSRMS, associated with neck floats from January 1st, 2019 through January 25th, 2024. The most common hazard pattern identified by this data set involves children slipping through the neck opening of the neck float, submerging themselves underwater. Staff broke this category down further based on the incidence association with inflation as the probable cause for slip through. Slip through events have been reported by caregivers using the neck float with their child for the first time, as well as by those who use the neck float multiple times or on a recurring basis. Slip through has been reported with children actively moving around while using the floats and when floating while remaining relatively motionless. Potential lubricants, such as soap or shampoo, have also been reported in conjunction with slip through events. Slip through not associated with inflation, which accounts for 52 incidents and includes one death, include reports of loss of consciousness and aspiration. These incidents have been identified as not associated with inflation because their reports indicate the caregiver inflated or reinflated the neck float prior to use, and the caregiver examined the neck float for leaks before and after the incident, but found no leaks present. Next, slip through incidents associated with inflation. CPS RMS data reported 54 incidents, including one death and two injuries, where the child was admitted to the hospital due to the incident. Slip through was reported to occur under the same conditions noted previously. However, these reports also indicate that the neck float was experiencing an inflation issue. This includes cases where the caregiver noticed a leak in the neck float either before or after the incident. The neck float tore open during the incident. Air was intentionally bled out of the neck float after inflating it due to perceived discomfort, or the product was used one or more times without inflating the product between uses. In addition to incidents involving slip through, there was also at least one case reported in CPS RMS where the straps of the neck floats restraint system tore off the product while in use, which can lead to the same drowning hazard created by a child slipping through the product. Finally, there are three reported cases where the victim submerged their mouth or nose underwater by contorting or rotating their bodies, despite being fully retained within the neck float, and one reported incident where a puncture in the float allowed it to fill with water during use until the float became heavy enough to pull the victim underwater while still retained within the neck float. Next slide, please. We will now discuss the current voluntary standards requirements. 
ASAM F963-23 includes provisions for aquatic toys, which it defines as an article, whether inflatable or not, intended to bear the mass of a child and used as an instrument to play in shallow water. This does not include bath toys, beach balls, and United States Coast Guard approved life-saving devices. Next slide. However, while aquatic toys must meet the general requirements for all toys, such as lead and phthalate restrictions and small parts requirements, ASCM F963-23 does not include any mechanical or other physical performance requirements specifically for aquatic toys. Next slide. ASCM F963-23 does require specific labeling for aquatic toys to include a statement that it is not a life-saving device and instructions to not leave a child unattended while the device is in use. However, this does not address or inform about injuries or deaths that have occurred while using aquatic toys like neck floats. Next slide. I will now go through the draft proposed rule, which includes four requirements for conditioning, buoyancy, the restraint system, and the neck opening, as well as warning and instructional literature requirements. Next slide. First, we will discuss the conditioning requirements. Staff recommends a rule taken from ANSI UL 12402-9, the standard for personal flotation devices, and from ANSI APSP ICC 16, the American National Standard for Suction Outlet Fitting Assemblies for use in pools, spas, and hot tubs, with some modifications. The rule will require neck flows to be conditioned in two eight-hour windows, first at a hot temperature point, then at a cold temperature point. Following this, the neck float will be held for 24 hours at room temperature. Next, the float will be submerged for eight hours in darkness in a chlorinated saltwater bath. And finally, the neck float will undergo UV conditioning in accordance with any of the four options provided by ANSI APSP ICC 16. The four options differ in terms of length of time and exact UV exposure conditions, but are otherwise considered equal to each other. Uh, the choice of which option to use is left to the discretion of the evaluator and is primarily dependent on their equipment or resource needs. Staff proposes these conditioning requirements for neck floats prior to conducting any other test which the product uh, within this proposed rule to simulate the foreseeable use conditions which the product may be stored or used in. Temperature changes can introduce both short and long-term impacts on any material, including expansion and contraction, softening, cracking, or breaking. Exposure to chlorine environments, as may be expected of a pool, can result in an adverse chemical reaction with a plastic or polymer chain that the material has not been carefully selected for or prepared with suitable chemical resistances. And UV light can cause degradation of plastics and polymer chains through a photochemical effect that, over time, might weaken, discolor, or make plastics brittle to the touch. Next slide. Next, the minimum buoyancy requirement. Staff proposes that neck floats must demonstrate a minimum awkward buoyancy equal to or greater than 30% of the neck floats expected weight capacity, determined by the recommended user age and weight of the neck float. Additionally, staff is proposing to require that inherently buoyant neck floats may not lose more than 5% of their initial buoyancy after being submerged for a 24 hour period. Staff is recommending adopting a modified version of the testing equipment and method from ANCUL 12402-9 for this rule. The rule will require a weighted cage suspended by a calibrated load cell to submerge the neck float in a tank of fresh water large enough that the cage may be lowered to a depth of one to one and a half meters below the surface of the water without contacting any sides or the bottom of the tank. The cage shall be weighted to 1.1 times the expected weight capacity of the neck float to ensure that there is sufficient load to fully submerge the weighted cage system when combined with the neck float. To determine the actual buoyancy of the neck float, it will be secured within the cage such that both it and the cage always remain approximately horizontal and level. Pictured here are two such examples, one where the weights rest on mounting poles above the float and another where the weights are tied to a net hung below the float. First, a weighted cage with the product is submerged underwater and a calibrated load cell is used to record the weight of the system. Then the neck float will be removed and the immersed weight of only the weighted cage on its own will be recorded. The neck float's buoyancy is the difference between these two reported weights, and it must be greater than or equal to 30% of its expected weight capacity. For inherently buoyant neck floats, a middle step is added. After the first measurements, the cage and float will be left submerged for 24 hours, and the weight will be recorded again. The initial buoyancy must still meet or exceed the same 30% threshold, but the difference between the initial and post 24 hour buoyancy may also not exceed 5% of each other. Finally, any inflatable components of the neck float must be inflated to an internal pressure of 0.1 PSIG for the duration of this test. 
So that proposes to evaluate the minimum required buoyancy of the neck float as a function of its intended user weight to ensure the requirement adequately, adequately accounts for all possible users, which between zero and 48 months can range from 10 to 52 pounds. In addition, staff proposes that inherently buoyant neck flows must demonstrate no more than a 5% loss of buoyancy after being submerged for 24 hours to ensure that inherently buoyant materials like foam do not absorb enough water such that the product's ability to float properly is adversely impacted. Next slide. Now we will discuss the restraint system. Uh, the rule will require neck float fasteners, such as buckles, to have a release mechanism with a double action release system that requires two distinct but simultaneous actions to release, or a single action release system that requires a minimum of 50 newtons to release. The rule will also subject the restraint system to the mechanical integrity test from ASTM F833-21, which requires subjecting the restraint system to a 45 pound load five times and checking that the straps of the system have not slipped by more than one inch after the conclusion of this test, and that the closing means, such as buckles, do not separate from each other, or that the restraint system does not separate from its attachment points on the product during the test. Staff proposes these requirements to reduce the risk of restraint system failure, leading to children becoming submerged while using neck loads. Next slide. The final performance requirement proposed by staff involves the neck opening of the float. The rule will require neck floats to not admit the passage of a head probe when subjected to a specified dynamic movement. Under this proposal, the opening of the neck float will first be saturated with a soapy solution. Next, a weighted head probe will be placed in the float and a hanging weight will be suspended from the probe below it. The proposed test will require the hanging weights to be swung from below the float in 10 alternating fronts to back and side to side cycles. This will be done by drawing the hanging weight up to a 90 degree displacement angle and releasing the weight allowing it to swing freely for 30 seconds. Once 30 seconds have passed, the weight will be brought up to a 90 degree angle, this time in the required alternating direction and released again. As with the buoyancy test, any neck float which relies on inflatable components will have those components inflated to 0.1 PSIG. Pictured here on the right is a sample neck float set up for this testing. The float has been positioned on a flat surface over a circular cutout large enough for the probe to fall through, but not so large that the sample itself falls. Below the table, you can see the hanging mass suspended from the end of the probe. To begin this test, that hanging mass will be brought up towards the front of the table until it reaches that 90 degree displacement and released. After 30 seconds have passed, it would then be brought up to that 90 degree angle, this time to one of the sides of the table and released again. The head probe, the weight of the head probe, the weight of the hanging mass, and the length that is suspended below that probe are all dependent on the recommended user age of the neck float. Pictured on the left of this slide are the four possible probe options. From left to right, the first probe is for children between zero and three months, the second for children up to six months, the third for children up to 18 months, and the last for children up to 48 months. The dimension of these probes are based on available anthropometric data for children's heads. The narrowest end of the probe represents the fifth percentile neck breadth and depth dimensions per its age group. And the widest end of the probe represents the fifth percentile head length and breadth dimensions for that same age group. So that proposed this requirement to directly evaluate the neck float's ability to successfully retain the occupant during foreseeable use conditions. The suggested dynamic motion imitates activity described by incident data. The inclusion of the soapy solution accounts for the use of possible lubricants such as soap, shampoo, or sunscreen. And the head probes are sized to account for the fifth percentile user in their respective age ranges. Next slide. On this slide are two video demonstrations demonstrating the neck opening test I just described with neck floats that seem to differ from each other only in color.
Uh, the recommending warnings and instructional literature requirements are pictured here. Uh, shown here is an example of a warning label that will be placed on a neck float. Uh, staff is recommending product warnings that include a description of the hazard, information about the consequences of exposure to the hazard, and instructions regarding appropriate hazard avoidance behaviors. The proposed warning label will also require manufacturers to include a maximum and minimum intended user age and weights on the warning label, as well as a warning specifically for neck floats comprised of inflatable components that directs caregivers to check for leaks before use and to never use when leaks are present. Right, next slide. Now I will discuss the potential small business impact. Staff have found 19 firms that supply neck float products to the U.S. market. This proposed rule would have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small businesses, primarily from redesign costs in the first year that the final rule would be effective. Next slide. Staff is recommending the commission publish the notice of proposed rulemaking for neck floats with an effective date of 180 days after publication of the final rule. Staff is also recommending imposing an anti stockpiling provision because, given their low inventory cost, neck floats are susceptible to being easily stockpiled before the implementation of this rule. Additionally, staff looks forward to receiving comments on the recommended effective date and feedback on the recommended performance requirements. Next slide. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank the NECFLOW team members who are listed on the slide for their hard work and their professional effort to bring this draft proposed rule to you today. Uh, thank you. We are now available for questions. Thank you very much. Um, move to questions at this point in time. Uh, questions of the commission, again, thanks to the team for uh, the briefing today um, and for the work that has gone into this package uh, so far. Um, with the, uh, you had focused on at one point in time talking about uh, the aquatic toy label, uh, labeling requirements, other work that ASTM has been doing for aquatic toys. Um, but they have they looked at any of the uh, toys or or devices that wrap around necks like this, or is this sort of a separate work? Can you go into more detail as to whether or not the voluntary standards groups have done um, significant work in this area? Sure. Uh, in August of 2022, uh, the ASTM F1522 subcommittee formed an aquatic toy revision task group to develop a draft ballot for performance requirements for aquatic toys. Uh, to date, however, there have been no balloted draft requirements to come out from there that we have received. Okay, so not a lot of work, or at least not a lot of progress in that work. No, no balloted draft work. Okay. And the proposed uh, standard they put forward in the NPR um would there be any water uh, neck floats that would continue to uh, be out there how would they what would they look like at the end sure um staff assessed the use of the product and the associated hazard patterns and determined that there was a performance standard that could be met that would be able to address the hazards noted by the incident data staff have conducted sample testing that is representative but not exhaustive of what is currently available in the market uh, staff did not evaluate any product that meets all the requirements of the proposed rule through this testing effort. However, based on the performance of some of those samples tested, staff do assess that products on the market, particularly inherently buoyant sample products, uh, either could or are uh, compliant to meet the performance of this uh, proposed standard. Inherently buoyant, you mean um, products that are not the really inflatable ones, but ones that have a, a buoyancy in the materials themselves? Is that... that is correct, yes. Understood. Um, and turn to my colleagues actually at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Goldstein and Ms. Ab, thank you for the presentation today. Uh, I, I have significant concerns about this product category. I say this based on uh, uh, my many years as a lifeguard, uh, but also my many years of service as a commissioner on uh, on, on on CPSE. Uh, I. Uh, I, I, I think this product category is a terrible idea, uh, and I'm not sure that I'm fully on board with the approach that, that we're discussing today. I'm concerned that there are products on the market that wouldn't necessarily qualify as toys, uh, that they're not marketed as an instrument of play or, or otherwise to, to get in you know, via the, the Section 106 route. Um, I have significant concerns uh, on the product category based on the incidents that I've seen. Uh, and in the discussion of the hazard patterns that you presented today. So I, I'm not concerned that section 106 alone 
is the appropriate approach. Uh, it, it probably isn't appropriate to discuss in, in open session. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to request a, a closed session after this, but but to discuss why an outright ban under Section 8 might not be appropriate here. That's a high bar. Uh, the commission needs to find that there's no feasible consumer product safety standard that would adequately protect the public from the risk of injury. Uh, but particularly where we're talking about deflatable neck floats, products that are designed to be strapped around an infant's neck so that they can be floating in water. I, I, I truly do wonder whether that's not a, a, a standard that, that, that we could clear here. Uh, I'll reserve the rest of my questions for uh, uh, closed session. Uh, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this uh, and uh, you know, per, per, perhaps we'll have a little bit more clarity on a, 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 a path forward after um, a closed discussion. Thank you. Commissioner Trumka. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Chair, before I get into questioning, can we check with Cynthia and Dan if they have that video available? I'd like to see that before we're asking anything, if we can. I think at this point in time, the files that were provided to them did not include the video, so we'll have to be able to provide the video to the public and to us at uh, a later point. I see. Okay. Um, well, thank you for your work in addressing this concerning hazard, and thank you for putting forward a proposed solution. I appreciate it. Um, can you give an estimate? I mean, is there a sense of how many units of covered products have been sold? How many are out in the market? Good morning, Commissioner. I think I can help with that question. Uh, sold, um, seen as high as 430, 440,000 around 10 or years. Um, that's from the largest supplier uh, could be as high as a million over a lifetime. Appreciate that context, Mr. Moscoso. Thank you. Um, for the the neck opening testing, um, which I was going to ask about, can you tell us a little bit about how, if there's no video, but can you explain how that testing works? I think you did in terms of the alternating front to side or front and back, side to side. But what I want to know is, is if it falls through at any point in that, it fails that test? That is correct, yes. So the full test is to do the alternating pattern of five front to back swings, five side to side swings, switching between the two. If at any point in time during the course of those 10 swings, the neck float, uh, the neck probe, the head probe falls through the neck float, that will be considered to not meet the requirements of this proposed rule. And it must, it must remain in seated in the float for the entirety of that test. Okay, and any repositioning of the probe between the swings or no? Okay. Um, one thing on that, if they're trying to pass that test, does anything in the proposed rule stop manufacturers from trying to make these neck holes smaller to pass the, the neck opening test? Sure. Uh, so staff looked at strangulation as a possible hazard to be considering uh, with this product but did not identify suffocation due to tightness of the product as a hazard pattern in the neck float incident data. And staff do not anticipate the neck floats that are compliant with this proposed rule will apply any more pressure to the throats of children than current neck float products on the market. Uh, the root cause of slip through isn't a question of tightness, it's a matter of firmness. Though the neck float might seem snug and tight to the neck when it is first put on the chart,
firmly below the waterline, it's virtually impossible to orient a neck float in such a way that it doesn't ultimately come back to a head upright position so long as the product as the product is buoyant enough to properly support the weight of the child. So by implementing the minimum buoyancy requirements, staff aims to avoid issues where the child may be able to, for prolonged periods of time, submerge their face or neck by moving their body around, though the product is still wrapped around their neck. Okay, so, so it's a temporary contact because they end up being like a buoy, you know, it flips them back up right out. Okay, uh, and you're going to have to help me with the buoyancy stuff because, you know, I get in the water, I try to float, I sink like a stone. I, I understand very little about buoyancy. And when we talk about the upper buoyancy of 30% of the expected weight capacity of the neck float, I don't really know what that means. Like, what, what's a life jacket in comparison? Can you explain what that really means to us? Sure, yes. Um, so the average human, when submerged to their neck underwater, will bear about 10% of their dry land weight. So requiring the upward buoyancy to be equal to or greater than that 30% threshold of the expected weight that the product is supposed to be able to maximally support is based on applying a safety, a safety factor of three to that 10% measurement. Uh, the safety factor is based on performance requirements actually in ASTM F963 for toys intending to bear the weight of a child, such as the overloading test for ride on toys and toy seats in section 8.28. Uh, which require the load to be three times either the weight indicated by a specified table or the manufacturer's uh, stated weight capacity. Uh, as a comparison to life jackets, uh, it generally doesn't take a lot of weight to actually, for a life jacket, to keep someone buoyant. Um, children up to 13 years old really only need about seven pounds of force to do so. Most adults between 7 and 12 uh, will be able to keep their heads buoyant, and that is reflective of that about 7 to 12 percent of their body weight. So in general, life vests, life preservers go for that roughly 10 percent value. The requirements of this are to go for a safety factor of three times that amount. Very much appreciate that context. I think that makes it clear. Um, one question on the temperature conditioning, and the package describes an, AN, uh, an ANSI can UL uh, standard that requires two cycles of hot and cold conditioning, and the proposal decides to adopt one cycle of conditioning hot and cold, given that that seems to be more comparable to how we might store things in our homes as compared to personal flotation devices. Um, but I wanted to ask, you know, the shipping process, does that factor into this? Because if you're shipping one of these from China or wherever they're manufactured, isn't it also plausible that they go through cycles of extreme hot and cold in a shipping container on their way here that we might want to factor into that conditioning? It is possible that they may go through additional cycles throughout their lifetime, depending on where they're coming from. Uh, more specifically, though, <clears throat> in that ANSI UL standard, the second round of conditioning that is normally recommended there, because they do recommend that, is specifically for a donning test. So they're not looking at the product as whether or not it is able to materially handle that conditioning further. It's just once it comes out from the hot temp, once it comes out from the cold temp, how easily is it able to be placed on the prospective person that may need to be saved by the device? And are there any issues during that? So for the purposes of a neck float, which is not used as a life-saving device in that nature, uh, the single cycle from hot to cold is considered representative of what it may need to prove itself for. Um. Mr. Moscoso, one more question for you. Um, the analysis that we did on the number of small U.S. businesses, are we aware of, are we specifically aware of any small U.S. manufacturers that are making these products in the U.S.? We are not aware of a specific manufacturer that's, ma that's actually manufacturing in the U.S. Okay, and so we're basing this on the same estimates with the NAICS codes that, that okay. Um, I am uh, pleased to see that there's an anti-stockpiling provision in this, and I think that's a, a great addition here. Um, and the package states that neck floats have characteristics that make them ideal for firms seeking to stockpile, namely low inventory costs due to their small size, durability, and low costs of production. Can you explain why those particular characteristics make a product likely to be stockpiled? Uh, yes, uh, staff were concerned that for firms for which uh, the low cost, so inflatable neck floats tend to have the lowest cost of inventory. Uh, they package small, they show up uh, deflated so they can be stored in bulk uh, very easily. Uh, staff were concerned that potentially for firms for which inflatable neck floats may represent all or most of their business 
since they may not be as easily changed to meet this performance standard as say an inherently buoyant product that it presented a strong incentive to stockpile if they could not easily comply with the rule. So for those purposes, we wanted to make sure that there was an anti-stockpiling uh, anti provision suggested. And we'd be concerned about any products, stockpiling of any products that share those same characteristics, I imagine, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think we've been talking about another product that shares those characteristics this morning. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this topic. Uh, no more questions. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Goldstein and Ms. Zeb, for your work on this. Um, I just wanted to follow up uh, on your answer, Mr. Goldstein, to the chair about the voluntary standards work. I think you said there's no validated draft work that's been done, but can you give us just a little bit of a bit more of a flavor of what has happened in the voluntary standards? Has there been positive discussion? Can you just elaborate on that, please? I mean, there was always internal discussion within subcommittees, uh, and there can be as many different viewpoints as there are members to that committee. Uh, but to date, there hasn't been a ballot to result from that discussion. Uh, staff were provided a possible draft language for the aquatic toy revision task group, but ultimately that did not go to result in any ballot coming from it. Um, I thank you. I appreciate that. Has there been significant opposition with the that staff has been um, observing in in the process that has gone on thus far? Staff have observed it as a discussion, but to date, they uh, there has been no determination coming out from it beyond the creation of the task group to look at possible revisions. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? There's been no. Uh, Beyond looking at the uh, the aquatic toy revision task group to look at possible revisions to the aquatic toy draft, uh, there hasn't been any other movement coming forth from that group. So just to make sure I understand what you're saying, there's been a formation, but not significant work. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. I don't have further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Honserik, and, and thank you to Mr. Goldstein, Ms. Eb, and the entire team. Uh, first, I, I, I want to say I have significant concern about a product that would provide caregivers uh, a false sense of safety in and around water. Uh, I spent over 10 years in aquatic safety, including uh, lifeguarding, swim instructor, uh, uh, teaching folks how to uh, how to teach lessons uh, uh, ranging from infants to, to adults. And the one thing I would note, and to anyone who can hear my voice and to those who can amplify my voice, it is always dangerous for parents and caregivers to leave a small child alone in and around water. Uh, as I think uh, many in this room know, uh, the number one cause of death between, for children and infants between the ages of one and four is drowning. And so I, if you're using these products currently, uh, do not leave the child alone in, in around and near the water and have a false sense of safety. Uh, with that, I look forward to uh, the conclusion of uh, uh, this part of the process uh, and I have no further comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're now going to conclude the public portion of this briefing and move to an executive session, which is an question. Um, again, thanks to all the staff for the briefing today. And at this point, we're going to clear the room and move to a different um, uh, WebEx. Thank you. <laughs>